Hello, Chantel. All right. Let me take a second to get audio and video up and running here. Hopefully, we don't have like last week <laughs> technical difficulties. Let's see if we need to turn on. Hello. 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 Hi. Let's see if I can get my video working. Okay, can you see me okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Chantel, how are you? I'm good. I haven't seen you since high school. Uh, it's It's been a while. <laughs> Is so good which was you. in uh 19 <clears throat> yeah that was, a, that was a while ago <laughs> oh my it was that's so, that's so crazy oh, i'm so excited to have you as our guest today i know my students are as well this is going to be a lot of fun um we're sorry our connection might be a little slow but that's all right we will make do uh, so first and foremost, let's go ahead and just get started and let you introduce yourself, tell them where you're coming from, uh, where you're joining us today, a little bit about your career and what you do. Okay, I'm in Nashville today and I am a artist and songwriter and I've been doing this for a very long time and I love it. Um, it is definitely not an easy way to uh, make a living, but nothing in the arts is. <laughs> but I do love it, and I'm just excited to to share a few thoughts and answer some questions today, and maybe play you a song if we have time. Awesome. So, so how did you how did you pick this this career? How did this all come about? So I was always a person who was an observer and I was always someone who was writing. So I was always writing poetry and short stories and I always loved English and I always loved music. And there was a point in my life that I realized that I, I could bring the two together. And so that's how it all started. And it was definitely not something I knew grow up thinking, like I want to be a singer songwriter and this is what I want to do. Um, but I think that as you continue in your life, there will be things that, at least for me, they, it was like the thing that kept tugging at my sleeve. And saying, okay, you need to pay attention to this. You need to develop this. And this is part of your life's work. So for me, um, that's been something I really tried to do over the years. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. So now I, I remember going back to our, our high school days that this was, um, that you, as you mentioned English, you mentioned the arts and stuff. Um, when was it though after high school that you said, you know what, this is the path I want to take? When did that, that realization, when did this career path really start for you? So, um, Again, it wasn't an overnight kind of moment for me. It was um, a series of events. And some things happened in my life that um, I really wouldn't write about those things. And so initially, a lot of the songwriting was a catharsis for me. So it was about um, sharing what I couldn't and say write about for a song because I was a little more removed from it. Um, and then I think from there, I, I actually, um, I had grown up singing in choirs and um, 
doing some singing, uh, but I actually went to um, a vocal instructor when I lived in Georgia um, in Atlanta. And I said to her, I want you to listen to me sing and play you a song of mine. And I want to tell you, I want to see what you think about it. And if you think I have a good enough voice that people would want to hear me sing. And I look back on that moment and this was, I don't know, probably 20 years ago. And I think to myself how much power I gave that vocal instructor and um, thankfully she said, yeah, you have a good voice and I think, I think you should sing and I think you should do this. And so I started to, um, I would, I kind of had this support group of other songwriters in the area and we would get together and play our songs for each other and encourage each other. And then as a group, we started um, playing out at local coffee shops and um, it just kind of was something that gradually took hold for me. And then I decided, well, you know, I really want to learn more about music. And so I decided to go to school at Berkeley College of Music in Boston, which is um, the reason I decided to go there is because they had an emphasis on rock, pop, and jazz. Um, so it wasn't a classical music school it focused on contemporary music and so I went there and um, studied there and finished there and then you know after that you know when you look at music cities there's really only I would say three options um, when you look at the US um, there's New York um, Los Angeles and Nashville and we had come on a spring break trip as, a, um, as students to Nashville and had done some industry tours and talked to some people and seen the city. And I had been here a couple of times and I really liked the city and so in Nashville. And that was, um, I've been here ever since. So tell us a little bit about Nashville. What what are some of your favorite places? Where have you where have you played? Where have you written? That kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, I I think Nashville is a real city. Um, it's a small city. It's um, kind of feels like if maybe if you've been to Portland, Oregon, it kind of has that vibe. It's kind of a blend between a small town and a city. Um, I don't know if any of the students have been to Nashville. Has, has anybody been to Nashville? Um, it's, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice place. It really is. And, um, I don't know if any of you have seen the TV show Nashville or saw it when it was popular a few years ago, but it's not, it, it's not like that really. It's, um, the industry is a very interesting industry. In fact, I have a couple of, um, I don't know, Brad, if you wanted me to, or Mr. Skinner, I should say, <laughs> if you wanted me to um, go through a couple industry things, but I have a couple slides because I thought it might be interesting oh, yes, to please. share a bit, a bit about how songwriters get paid. Um, so I can share that if you want. Yeah. Or, right ahead that's, that's good information I think it's okay. thing to learn okay let me share I will share my screen here okay so um, can you see it? Okay. All right. So one of the questions that when I travel around, especially if people are interested in pursuing a career in songwriting, this is, this is good information to have. This is how songwriters get paid. Um, basically when you write a song, it is, it is like 
you have you have a copyright for that intellectual property and the song is owned by the songwriter who creates it and also the publisher who publishes the song um and i'll talk a little bit about a couple of things there in a minute but the recording is owned by either the record label or the artist if the artist is paying for it so whoever pays for the recording owns what's called the master or or the recording of a song that's why when you hear like let's say you'll hear um, the movie yesterday that just came out fairly recently it had a lot of Beatles songs in it um, the recordings that they were doing of those Beatles songs in the movie those would be considered master recordings. So whoever was paying for that movie and for the recording of those songs, they would oh, own the right. master. But obviously the Beatles wrote the song, so they would still own the song and the publishing of the song. Um, does that make sense to everybody so far? Yeah. Okay. And then what happens is you license the song to be, so you never, you, you never give away the rights to the ownership of the song, but you license it to be reproduced, performs, distributed, used for sampling, made it to ringtones, whatever, whatever those things are. And then publishing deals that is how, that's one way songwriters can get paid, or you can be like I am and you can self-publish. Um, but essentially publishing deals are publishers or companies that pay songwriters to write songs and then they act as agents. So essentially they go around and play your songs for a major artist. So if Carrie Underwood was looking for new songs for a new project, a publisher would go play songs. Um, so Carrie, Carrie's, they're called A&R people, but Carrie's people at the label would say, Carrie Underwood's looking for a song. She wants a song about getting your heart broken and she wants it to be up-tempo and kind of sassy. Well, that information would go out on what's called a pitch sheet. So publishers would get that pitch sheet and then they would go look at their song catalog and say, oh, you know, we've got five songs that are in that, that, that fit that. So they would make an appointment with the label to go play those five songs for the label. And then the label would decide whether or not they wanted to um, play the song for Carrie or if they didn't, if they didn't feel like it was a good fit. Um, and if you don't have a publishing deal, you can hire what's called a song plugger, which essentially they do the same thing as a publisher. They go out and play your songs for artists. Um, but there's different ways that you get your songs from, you know, in, in the, in front of artists that would record them. Um, another, another just quick slide on money. So, um, it's kind of like a pie. The publisher gets half of the money and the songwriter gets half. Um, there are different royalties in play. So you have mechanical royalties, which are, um, so you get paid per unit or download, you get paid nine cents. So if someone wants to record a song of mine, I'll ask them how many units. And if they say, well, I want, you know, I want to purchase, I don't know, 2,000 units, then I get nine cents per unit if I wrote the song. So that's one way. And another way you get money is through performance royalties, which is when it's played on air, used on TV, internet, radio, etc. 
And then I also write for film and TV. So um, I get what's called a sync fee, um, which is when the music and pictures, the music and pictures put together, then that's called a sync. And that's a one-time fee that you get. Um, and then you can also get mechanical royalties and you can also get royalties when it's um, played on, on TV. Um, so a few years ago, I had about six songs in a series called Heart of Dixie. And I still get royalties from that because it still plays on Netflix and it plays in foreign countries. And I still get, I still get money from those, from those song, from those songs in those TV shows. So that gives you a little bit of idea where the money comes from. That's, 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 that's a lot. Wow. A it's really, yeah. it's really complicated and it's, um, it's collected and distributed by a lot of different organizations. Um, the track, all of this and everything. So kind of complicated. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So tell us a little bit about the, the, the movie process. How, how does that come about that you end up with an opportunity to write for a, a TV show or a film? So opportunities come in a few different ways. Um, for independent, um, for independent films, I'll generally be talking with the director or the producer and they will say, um, they'll say a few different things. They'll say, uh, we need, a, we need music for this scene and they'll describe the scene and they'll, sometimes they'll give you what's called a reference track. So they may say like, I want this to sound like, um, Taylor Swift, bad blood. Right. And then you're, because they, they can't afford to license that song because the license is too high. So you essentially create a song that has similar qualities and a similar vibe to that song. So it's, um, it's not based on that song, but it's, it's kind of like, something to shoot for. It gives you an idea of what sounds they're looking for and what things they're looking for. So that's one way that it could come. Um, I've been sent actual scenes that have been cut before and said, you know, here's the scene, not, not a description of the scene, but here's, here's the scene and watch it and come up with something that would fit this. Um, like a montage, like every movie, usually has a montage and so like if it's the love montage like you might see a couple you know they're in the park together and then they're on a walk together and then they're playing that they may be looking for a song that will fit that but unlike writing storytelling songs which is what we do in the country market you write when you write for film and TV, you you have to capture more of an emotion than you do. Um, I use your song because the story's unfolding on screen. Um, so you want to you, you want to help her convey the feelings and the emotion that they're trying to to get. So um, opportunities come from, um, I'll have my story in a music library and those things are just selected um, by a, what's called a music supervisor. And so I won't even like talk to pick the song based on the qualities that they're looking for and I'll just get a sense for it. The other scenario I've had, and this is called, um, this is called work for hire writing. 
It would be like if I was a painter and someone said that I want you to do a portrait of me, do a portrait. Um, the, the work for hire concept comes into play if there's music needed for something specific. So I have a friend who's a playwright and he um, wanted to do some songs in, a, in an original play. And so he called me and he said, I want a song that sounds like Johnny Cash and it has to be about this and you know, it's fitting. And so then I created that song for him and he paid me for that. And I still own the copyright. I still own that song so I can do other things with it if I want, but he paid me to create it for that specific play. Um, and so that's another way that you can, that you can create music is kind of in a work for hire environment. I have some friends who, you know, like if someone's getting married or whatever, they'll hire a songwriter to write like a special song based on, you know, that couple's relationship as they are getting married to perform at the ceremony or whatever. Those are kind of work for hire scenarios. So I don't know um, if you got my thing about the aha moments for creators, if I could share that. Please do. Um, I, so I was thinking about, um, first of all, like I, I would love to know more about you as, as students. And maybe we can just do this by raise of hand, but how many of you think you might pursue some kind of a creative career? I raise a hand. So maybe about half. And of um, how many of you think you might have a, a side job doing something creative? So for example, you may have a day job, but then you have like a photography business on the side. Is there anybody that fits into that category? Um, so I think whether or not you're going to do acting or photography or music or um, really any kind of creative field, um, and honestly, there's a lot of creativity in the business world as well. Um, I think about people who are software developers, for example. There's a ton of creativity that goes into creating software and how it will work and how it will look. So I think we're all creators in our own way. Um, but I wanted to just share what I call kind of my aha moments about being a creator with you. Um, if that's okay, I'll, I'll take a couple minutes to do that. Is that all right? Yes, go right ahead. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so the first thing that I would say that um, took me a long time to learn is that it's important to find your authenticity. So the only thing that makes you and all of us different than anybody else is how, how we see the world. And so if you're going to be a creator, you have to be willing to be real, to be honest and personal. Um, there was a quote I read recently that, um, um, she said, don't dip your pen in someone else's blood. It's a little gross when you think about it that way, but at the same time, like really, you, you have a unique experience and a unique view that's all your own. And so finding that voice is taking the journey ahead and, and learning to listen to that inner voice. You'll face, obviously, all of us face a lot of critics along the way. And um, believe me, rejection is way more the rule than it is the daily experience. I mean, it's way more the daily experience than having a song that someone likes or someone wants to put in a film or, or a TV show. Um, there's a lot of rejection that you face. And so 
you have that authentic voice for yourself. Um, I also think a part of that is, um, I think the more personal you are willing to be, the more universal your work will become. So, um, so I was thinking about um, the the show, The Greatest Showman. I don't, I don't know if you've seen that that um, movie, but um, there's a song that dreams that Pink sang. And I think about this song because it's so universal. Um, the lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. I think about what the world could be. A vision of dreams is all it's going to take. Oh, a million dreams for the world we're going to make. And I, I think about that. That was written actually by two songwriters, not Pink. Pink didn't write that song. She job with it. But those songwriters tapped into something that I think we all feel. Um, we all have dreams and we all have things that we want to pursue and universal idea. Um, but they used a very bright, they talked about how they feel. The brightest colors in my head, a million dreams keeping me awake. They're not saying, hey everybody, you all have a million dreams. And I know, you know, there's a million of you out out there no they're talking about their own experience and because it's it's a very personal experience but it's also a very universal feeling um that leads me to the second kind of aha moment for me was learning to create with a purpose it's kind of at least for me it taps into leave about, about um, the individual purposes that, and i i try to follow a higher purpose in my life and a higher being. So um, I, I, I always think about like what, what I want people, um, you know, if, if you, if you want someone to walk away with the feeling of happiness or a feeling of sad, just describe or, um, create a space for them to feel that in. Um, and I think that, you know, there's really only a few different kinds of songs. There's, I love you. I, I wish you loved me. I hate you. Um, we're in love. Like there's only a few to know about. And so I'm always thinking like, what's the message? What's the message that I want people to hear with this song or what, what do I want them to know about these characters and what do I want them to feel? So I always try to, to aim for something. So as you're creating, you know, maybe you're a photographer, if you're trying to evoke a certain emotion, find the setting, the light, the time of year kind of emotion, um, and kind of have a vision of what you want to put out into the world. Um, the next thing is to develop your instincts. Um, I think that, that this is kind of going back to the authenticity in your voice, but you have to know when something, when it looks right on a canvas, if you're directing a play, you have to know when it looks right on a stage. If you're acting in a play, you need to know when you're and you're able to kind of share that, that character's view of the world. Um, I like, I'll give you an example. Um, I had written a song, writing a song in Nashville, we do so we write with other people. And that's an interesting experience to kind of create with other people. It's like being, you're kind of, um, but 
you know, I, we were talking about, um, we had seen a sign, we had been out at a club one night and we had seen this advertisement that it was for abuse and it said, Let's go. and then it turns out one of my co-writers had been in an abusive relationship. And so instead of just saying, you know, she had a black and blue and bloody eye, we said um, she never knew knew what was coming when he closed the door and everybody gets what that's about and in your mind you're playing out some kind of story in your mind we can't help but do it it's like we have a little person inside our mind it's like running to those images in our head it doesn't matter if you haven't been in an abusive relationship right and so that's the kind of stuff that as a songwriter you you have to think about like where you're how how do you want to tell a story that's engaging and when does it feel right to you because it's a very subjective kind of thing and so you have to kind of learn and, and it changes over time and the the creative bar that you hold for yourself is higher um, as you develop in your craft. And then the last thing that I'll just throw out there is that, um, and this is again from, I just call it walking with the masters. So when I moved to Nashville, even though I already had a music degree and was for a while, I would go to the Bluebird Cafe every month and I would listen to hit songwriters play their songs at because I think at the end of the day, there's so much great work out there and there are people who are further along in the journey still do. And what I would just throw out as an idea to consider is, you know, if you are somebody that aspires to be a novelist, then read great novels. Find out what it is that hit you in your heart and in your gut. Um, find out what it is about the styles they use, they use as writers. Um, it's the same thing with anything right? If you know, dissect that guitar solo and find out, you know, what is it about that lyric that makes you, how, how is it that they're impacting you and touching your heart and then use those tools. Um, I, I always, um, one of the greatest gifts for me as a songwriter um, is when I look out into the audience and I'll see someone who's crying. Well, it's not that I like seeing people cry <laughs> necessarily. That makes me sound mean, but it's, it's because I know that I've moved them and that I've said something so couldn't help but feel something. And, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say we live in this world of social media and phones and a lot of, ironically, a lot of for all, all of us, we, we tend to feel more disconnected, not more connected. And I think people need to feel. And I see it as one of my jobs as a songwriter is to help people feel whether that's to feel happy or to feel sad or to feel nostalgic or whatever, what makes music such a powerful tool. And so if you have the opportunity to sit down with someone that you admire their work or you, you know, go to classes, listen to other people talk about how they what tools they use in the writing process, what tools they use 
you know, in acting, what tools they use for any creative field, then take the chance to do that and, and really make yourself a, you know, study work that you feel is, is great. Any creative work that you feel is great. So those are just a few, a few thoughts about creativity from me. <laughs> those are fantastic. Thank you. We're, we're going to go ahead. We've got a couple minutes. We can allow for some questions from the students. So we'll start here with Cameron. Okay. So, so when you're writing a song, like how many of the parts do you write? Like, do you write vocals and guitar or vocals, guitar and piano or drums? Like how many parts on average do you write and how many is expected? So, um, so I'll, I'll say there's kind of two major ways that songs are written. Um, there's kind of like, I call it Nashville style. And then there's like LA and New York style. Um, in LA, New York, and in a lot of the pop markets, what will happen is someone will write a track. So they'll write, so the music part. Um, not the top line melody and not the lyrics, but they'll write the music part, which is the chord changes. They'll have the drum parts. They'll have all like the music arrangement. And then they'll work with songwriters to do what's called a top line melody and um, the lyrics. So that's one way of writing the song. So it depends on like if you're writing in that style, you're either the person that's creating the track with all the parts and then you're working with someone to do the top line melody and lyrics. Or the way we do it in Nashville is you sit down in a room and you create everything together. So when you're actually writing the song, you write the lyrics, the chords, the melody all together, and then um, the same amount. So if I was in a room writing with two other people, let's say one person was just having a bad day and, or not really into the topic, the two, two of other of us will, will write a song in about three hours. That person's still going to have the same percentage ownership on a song that the other two people do because it's, it's seen as an equal proposition. Um, and then what you would do in Nashville is you would take that song to a studio and they would do the music behind it. And you would hire musicians called studio musicians and they would, they would play like the guitar parts and, and piano and all that. Um, but you just hire them to do that. Now I, so in January, and I could send I could send Mr. Skinner some information about this in January. I'm releasing a new five song project, and along with that, I'm doing a five day Nashville experience. So it's for five days. I'll send out a short video about different parts of the process of making a record here, like, and here's kind of how songwriting works and then and here's how it works in the studio and and you can kind of see just short videos are like two minutes if you want you can sign up to join that experience on my website um but that'll insight into how the process works here are there any other questions jordan um Oh, no, excuse me. Hi, Steve. I don't know if you can see me or not. Um, what's one thing in your, like, process? Kind of like a blurry blonde. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's fine. What? What, um, what is one thing in your process that's helpful to you, but you've never seen anyone else do? Like, what's one thing in your process that's unique to you? In my process of writing songs, yeah, or in yeah, in your songwriting process, um, 
I don't, I don't want to offend anybody there, but um, one thing that I do is I always pray before I write and I always pray before I perform. Um, that's, I do have a few friends in Nashville who do that. And when I write with them, we'll pray together. But unless I know for sure that that's something that they do, I don't do that. I, I would pray before the session to myself just that everything will go well and that we'll be able to, you know, say something that's honest and, you know, that we'll, we'll just have a good vibe in the room. Um, but that's something that, you know, again, like to each his own, you know, I mean, not everybody does that. That's a core thing to who I am. So that's something that I do, but I don't, usually do that publicly I usually do that you know before before a session or in the like the, the bathroom before I play or something like that cool thank you yeah yeah um have you ever met John Cash <laughs> Speak up. Uh, so, unfortunately, um, yeah, so I haven't met him way before I really got kind of into the circles that I would meet him. Um, I have him and um, Josh Turner and Taylor Swift and Little Big Town, like a lot of the country people I've met. Um, some of them are nicer than others, but, um, I also don't, you know, I can't even pretend to know how much pressure they're under and they're constantly kind of in the public eye. Um, one thing about Nashville that's kind of interesting is you will see famous people. Like I, I was out one day and I saw, um, Keith Urban and Nicole Kidman they're married, of course, and they live in Nashville, and they were, like, getting ice cream at Whole Foods, and they just, no one bothers them. Um, people in Nashville, like, if they're not performing and in that performer context, people just, they don't bother them. They just let them kind of have a normal life, and I think that's why a lot of famous people like living in Nashville, because they're not constantly being, like, bombarded by people as they're doing, you know, grocery shopping or out with their families for dinner. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Amber? Okay. So um, when you went to college, did you find that you learned anything that you don't really use now? And if so, what? No stuff. Um, you know, I think what college is, um, it, it it's certainly is, I've been to college twice. I went the first time for business, um, which has been really helpful in my music career. Um, the second time I went for music, um, I think there's things that I don't use. I mean, I, I don't use calculus on a daily basis. I don't use um, a lot of the jazz chords and things that I learned in music school, I just don't use that because I don't write jazz music. Um, but I think what colleges and especially music school for me, it, it gave me, it provided a structure and some tools that would have taken me longer to accumulate if I had done it on my own. And it also, um, I think it's just a, me, it's always like if something out, you can follow it through. You have a commitment to improvement. So in terms of skills that you learn in general, there's a lot you don't use, but at the same time, like I think it's a really valuable personal development opportunity. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. One more question, Cass. How do you okay. plagiarism in your writing? Good question. 
how do I what? Avoid plagiarism. How do I deal with plagiarism? Well, not only that, but like avoid it. Cause like, um, okay. you mean like, am I worried? Yeah. Like, yeah. So here's something that's, you're inspired. So what you, you do. Yeah. So, um, you know, realistically, there's no way to completely avoid it. Um, but you can, when, one of the things you do is you register it with what's called a performing rights organization. So if I wrote a song called, you know, uh, my hometown, um, I would register it with a performing rights organization. The problem becomes like a common thing, like my hometown, there's probably 500 songs already with that title. So part of avoiding plagiarism is trying to have unique ideas and then you just, you register it. And you know, there's a lot of different songs that are similar um, and probably even have the same title, but they're different songs. Um, but you know, you don't, I don't know. I mean, I know it happens, but I don't personally, I mean, every time you, you, you write a song, you're doing a recording of it. So you have that captured in your computer. And so like if, if somehow if I, and then, um, I captured my computer and we had the, the origin in there. I mean, you could go back and prove, like, let's say that, you know, somebody else wrote that exact same song. You could go back and say, like, okay, this was the creation date. But I mean, plagiarism is something that I not that I don't really worry about on a daily basis. Um, but I, I tell you, I have had I did have a situation where an independent filmmaker used some music of mine without licensing it. And I had to work with their company, their distribution company to get them to create a license because if you use someone's creative work without their permission, it's called copyright infringement. And that kind of stuff can happen. That's why you see, like, I don't know if you've ever put a YouTube video up that has somebody else's music. If, if, if it has someone else's music and you haven't gotten their permission, then they can take it down. So that's why you see, like, this, you know, this music's been taken down or this video's been taken down because the license owner of that song didn't want it to be, you know, didn't want it to be used. All right. Uh, so that's going to be, well, can I pick it, I, but go ahead. Can I pick a number between? Yeah, I was going to say, so, um, I wanted to send someone there or something. Um, so I have a copy of a movie called storm rider that I have a song in. Um, it's a really good, story about um, a girl and a horse and uh, anyway so I have a song called the great American song in here and um, and or it's called our American song and um, I wanted to send it to someone there so I will pick a number between 1 and 29 yep. um, I am gonna pick uh, 17 my name is Trista Perry. Okay, Trista, I'm virtually going to send you this. No, um, I'm going to mail it. <laughs> so, um, Brad, if you'll send me your address, I'll mail it to you. And I also have some, um, just some little stickers that say I support indie music. It has my website. I'll send you some of those as well to pass out. And, um, I hope I hope this was okay. I hope you guys learned something. And if you have a question, um, I would love it if you reached out to me on Instagram or any of the social media platforms. It's just at Shans Music, S-H-A-N-S Music. Okay.
Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm gonna, hang on one second. I'm going to get a picture. Even though you guys kind of look like a little bit blobs, I'm going to take a picture. Let's see if I can. Okay. Everybody wave. Yay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Hey, have Thank a good day, y'all. Thank you so all. much. It's so good okay. to see you again. Thank you, you for too. your time. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.